that we do have hope in Christ. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1, looking at verses 11 through 14. As you turn there, let me ask you this. So whenever you're buying something new, what do you look for? You look for the guarantee, right? When you're buying a, a new car or a computer or you're getting a new roof on your house, when you're, you're buying that new appliance or tires for the car, about anything, we want to know what, what's the guarantee, Right? So you, you buy a computer, you get a two-year guarantee on it. That's, that's pretty good. You know, tires, a five-year, 50,000-mile warranty. That's pretty good. You get the new roof on the house, 20-year transferable guarantee. And that's pretty good. Now, now, you're in the store, you're looking at that product, and all of a sudden you look down, and there's the seal on there, and it says, lifetime guarantee. I sold, right? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the cat's meow on that one, right? Lifetime guarantee. Well, then there's all the fine print with regard to the lifetime, whose lifetime and, and, and how long that lifetime really is and all the legalese that goes with the fine print that's so fine you really can't read it. And, and when it comes down to it, that lifetime guarantee is really only as good as the integrity of the company that is giving you the guarantee. You see, what is a guarantee? But a guarantee is, is the craftsman or the, the person who made the product or who is doing the work saying, I stand by my product, I stand by my work. And you and I have, I'm sure, had those times when you have something that breaks or something goes wrong and you have to now look at the guarantee and you call the company and, or you call the contractor and now you have to see how good their word really is. And sometimes that contractor or that company goes far above and beyond. They want to make sure that you understand that their guarantee is right, that they, their word, they're standing by their word. Other times you find out that the fine print was so fine you couldn't read it and really their guarantee isn't worth spit. It's, it's nothing because their character uh, is, is weak. They're, they're missing it. What if I told you, though, there's a guarantee from someone who never lies. There's a, a guarantee from someone who will stand by his word and stand by his work. And it's not just a lifetime guarantee, it's an eternal guarantee. Are you sold? Are you intrigued? You see, there's no fine print, there's no legal lease. It's the declaration of the craftsman saying, I began the work, I'm... I determined the work, I set the plan in motion, I have done the work, and I will bring the work to completion. You see, that's what God has done for us. And God has begun a work, he's established the work, he's done the work, and he said, I'm going to finish uh, what I've set forth to do. And that's where we're at in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, is, is Paul bringing this first section of his letter to the Ephesians to a close, and he's, he's bringing together all the thoughts that he's already mentioned. And just kind of a review, in verses 3 through 6, as we looked at that, we saw here's the God the Father, who before the foundation of the world, he's the one who chose us in Christ. He's the one who has predestined us for adoption of sons. So God determined, God set forth the, the plan. And so God the Father elected, and then in verses 7 through, 12, uh, 7 through 10 that we looked at last week, God the Son, he came and he, he became like us in every way except without sin, fully God, fully man. He lived, he died in our place, taking upon himself our sin. He was buried and rose again on the third day and, and ascended to heaven. And in so doing, he conquered sin, death, and hell. He redeemed us. So God the Father elected, God the Son redeemed. He did what God the Father had set forth uh, in eternity past. And then we come to verses 11 through 14, and now it's the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, seals and guarantees our redemption. You see, God is the one who seals it for us. He's the one who's the craftsman. It's his plan. It's his work, his eternal decree. Now, here's the wonderful thing. Since God is almighty, since God cannot lie, when God puts forth his guarantee, it rests on the integrity of his character. And more than anyone else, when God says it will be done, it's a guarantee that will not be broken. 
And so that's where we're at this morning. We come with, with all of the anxieties and all the things that life brings us. And then we have this wonderful promise of scripture that we have been redeemed in Christ. We have an inheritance and he will bring all of his plans to fruition because he said it and therefore we can trust in it because he keeps his word all the time, 100% of the time. So we come to this point in verses uh, 11 through 14, and we see all the work of God coming to fruition, right? So he, he has planned it. He has brought it together. God the Father, God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit guaranteeing our redemption. In these few short verses, we see the, the Trinity. We see all three persons of the Godhead active in our salvation. Let's read together uh, chapter 1 of Ephesians, verses 11 through 14. In him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Let's pray together. Father, as we gather around your word today, we're reminded that we have been chosen by you. You began the work. We have been redeemed through Christ and the Holy Spirit works in our hearts to bring us to Christ and he seals our salvation. He is the guarantee of our inheritance. And so we face this world with hope, with assurance, because our hope is found in you. We rejoice in that. Lord, may you guide us in your word today that we might know you and love you and give you the glory. Amen. Verse 11 and 12 begins this section and we see these words, in him we have obtained an inheritance. And in many ways, these two verses kind of recapture the wonder that Paul's expressed in the previous verses. And we saw as we began looking at this here, Paul in this section, he's just weaving together this wonderful doctrinal teaching along with praise and prayer. And it just weaves together. And he's doing that again here. And in him, in him, we've obtained an inheritance. And it echoes back to what he said in verse 5, that, that we've been predestined for adoption as sons, and that, that adoption as sons means that we are receiving an inheritance, we are co-heirs with Christ, that, that we are now children of God, and that there's this wonderful inheritance waiting for us. We've been reconciled to God, we have peace with God, and there's a, a hope that we have that helps us to see beyond the present to see the inheritance that's yet coming for us. Peter writes for us, and we read this earlier in our service, but let me go there again. First Peter, chapter 1, Peter writes about this inheritance, and look at what he says in verses 3 and 4. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Capture those words, a living hope. We don't have a hope that is just, why well, I, I, I kind of hope. No, no, this is a living hope that transforms the way we approach everything in our lives. Why? Because there's something beyond the now. There's a hope that takes us beyond the grief, beyond the hurt, beyond the pain and suffering of our present situation to see the hope that we have in Christ. It's a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Two, look at verse four, to an inheritance that is Im, Im, imperishable. It means it's, it's eternal. It's undefiled. It's, it's pure. It's holy. It's right. It's unfading. There's no decay. I, you know, I'm going to try and leave my kids an inheritance, but it's going to be meager to start with, and they may not get anything. It's going to decay. You know, it's, it's, it just, it's, going to fail because it's stuff in this material world. The inheritance God is giving us in Christ, it's unfading. There's no decay. There's no um, um, decrease. And it's kept in heaven for you. You see, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9 talks about it this way. He says, it is our promised 
eternal inheritance. Paul in Colossians, he talks about this promised inheritance from the Lord. And as he's writing to bond servants and he tells them as servants to, to obey their masters, to work, uh, to serve their masters, not to please the master, not because their eyes are on them, but to please the Lord. Why? Because they can suffer in the midst of this life because their, their eyes are on the Lord and the inheritance they have in the Lord and helps them to see beyond whatever, whatever temporal sufferings they may face. You see, and that's what Peter's writing about in First Peter as well. He's writing to, to Christians that are in the midst of suffering, saying, look beyond the suffering and see the inheritance that's imperishable, unfading, undefiled, kept for you. And it's, it's that inheritance that gives us hope in this life. It, it helps us to persevere knowing that this life is short. The sufferings of this life, although severe, although some of us face sufferings that may be excruciating and, and we can face these trials and sufferings, here's the thing, they will pass. And in Christ, we've obtained a promised, eternal, undefiled, unfading inheritance. That's our hope. And that's what allows us to, to, grieve, to grieve the loss of a fellow believer, but to grieve with hope, to see beyond this life to the joy that is beyond. And whether that fellow believer was 94 or 35, we can grieve with hope because they knew Christ and they're now in his presence enjoying the promised eternal inheritance that they have in Christ. You see, as we, as we walk this journey, as we go through life, that promised inheritance, it's kind of like I read a book with my kids recently about the Mayflower and the pilgrims as they're coming across the sea and there's months at sea and, and, and it's, it's a horrible voyage. We can romanticize as much as we want about what it was like for them, but it was a horrible voyage. And then just imagine as you're watching people sick and dying and the rations are getting low and everything else, and all of a sudden you hear that cry, land land and it's way out on the horizon they're not there yet they still have to go across part of the sea but they see land now there's hope and there's times we're tossed around in life and the sea seems to overwhelm us and the waves come crashing over our lives and then you hear that cry land there's land ahead we still have to go through the sea, but there's land. You see, that's what our hope in Christ is, right? We have a promised eternal inheritance. That's the land on the other side. And we go through this, this life and we get beat up. But our hope, our hope is in Christ. There's a land waiting for us. We're citizens of another land. And that hope is ahead. Verses 11 and 12 reiterate some important themes that Paul's woven together for us. I just want to kind of draw on a couple. In one week, we see this word obtained and inheritance, and we can almost say, well, we've obtained it, we've earned it, we've, and that's not the, the word that should be. It almost should be, we've received an inheritance. It's not that we've worked on it. In fact, Paul wants to emphasize that. Look at what he says in verse, uh, verse 11. He's kind of repeating some things he's already said. Having what? Having been predestined according to the purpose the plan, the design, the intention of him, of God, who works all things. What a wonderful promise that is, all things. It's not that some things are in his hands and some things aren't. God is sovereign over all things. He purposed it. He's over all things according to the counsel of his will. You see, our inheritance in Christ was not the result of our work. And therefore, there's no reason for us to be proud or self-confident Rather, God predestined us, God chose us, God determined before the foundation of the world that we be his children. Therefore, we are secure in him. 
Notice again, Paul wants us to know that this choosing of God, this work is not some random thing. It's not without purpose. Rather, notice that God describes the intentional redemptive work. Paul lays it out for us. Our being predestined was according to his purpose, according to his design, according to God's plan, according to the will of the triune God from eternity past. God designed our salvation. He planned our redemption. He established our eternal inheritance. Out of the overflow of his love, he brought us to himself. And then Paul rolls right into this to the praise, verse 12, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might what? Be to the praise of his glory. And we see that refrain again in verse 14. We've seen it before in this passage. It's to the praise of his glory. That's the conclusion of our salvation, the conclusion of our redemption. It's not about us. Ultimately, it's about him and his praise and living, lifting up our praise to him. Our, the work that God does in our life brings glory to God. God, the, the fact that God who is holy, God who is the righteous judge of all creation, he's the creator of his world, we broke his creation, and yet the fact that he would save anyone is humbling. It's an amazing expression of God's love and grace. This teaching of our being chosen, redeemed, and sealed by God should so stir our hearts to serve God with the worship of our whole lives, holding nothing back. So that that as we open our mouths, we would praise him in adoration, that we would be, be active in the work of telling others about this great God who has redeemed us and saved us. When we get this great gift, what do we want to do? We should tell others. When we're feeling sorry for ourselves, we come back to this passage. When we, when we feel anxious, we come back to this passage of who we are in Christ. When we're going through the difficult times, we come back to this passage and realize it's not relying upon us. We don't have to merely grit our teeth and press on in life. I mean, some days the grief and the anxiety is so heavy that all you can do is take the next step. And I get that. But here's the thing. We, we don't have to just take the next step pressing on. Uh, trying to do our best. We, we take that next step, reveling in God's gracious blessings. We appreciate the exquisite joy of being saved and we can live to the praise of his glory no matter what we face. So verses 11 and 12, almost a, it's a recapping of what Paul has already said in this passage. Then we come to verse 13, and now we, 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 we see him change now. And look what he says. He says, in him you also. Here's that in him again. And we've seen in Christ. Christ is the central part of Paul's message. We are to be in Christ. We are, we are chosen in Christ. We're redeemed in Christ. We believe in Christ. We're saved in Christ. It is in him, apart from Christ for nothing. And so in him, now you also. That's taken together with verse 12. This is wonderful picture. What he says, we who were first to believe in Christ, to the praise of glory. Now in him, you also heard and believed. And so there's this, this wonderful picture of those who were first and those who came later. And, and commentators differ on the interpretation of that, but there's some wonderful truths here. And Paul's going to draw on that. We looked at it a, a bit last week. We're going to see it more as we go through the book of Ephesians. This wonderful mystery that not only Jews, but Jews and Gentiles are brought together in Christ. And so the Jews who were first came to believe in him. And then the Gentiles were brought in later. They were engrafted and they were, were united together as one in Christ. Well, there's also the apostles and those who were following Christ first. And then those who came to know Christ through their teaching. So those who were first, then you also in him heard and believed. There's just wonderful promises for us in this. Whether, whether you come from a family that has generation upon generation of believers, or you're the first one in your family tree to trust Jesus Christ. In him, we're united whether you came to know Christ and trusted him as your Lord and Savior when you were just a child and your life has been going to church all your life and you you really haven't ventured off too far into rebellion and so forth, or whether you lived a a life of selfishness and debauchery and everything else and you've come to Christ later in life, 
whether you're first or whether you came later, you also are in him. You heard and believed. There's this wonderful picture of unity of the church. And it's that reminder. It's not about who we are. It's not about our, our heritage. It's not about our history. It's about who we are in Christ. It, it's, it's in him. That's where our hope is found. It's not about our work. It's not about our efforts in him. So look at what he says. He says in verse 13, in him, you also And notice the two verbs he used here in verse 13. You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, you heard and believed. That's the good news. Preached, heard, and believed. The Holy Spirit takes and opens the hearts and the minds of of those who hear the message so they understand their need for a Savior, and they believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. So they heard and they believed. And on the one hand, This is a call for everyone who hears the message of the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. The the gospel is this, you are not okay. The gospel starts with the bad news. Every person is born as a sinner, separated from God because we have rebelled against God. The Bible describes us as the enemies of God because of our sinfulness. We've tried to rule our own life. We've tried to, to, to be the king or the queen of our own life and, and kind of push God to the side. But God, our creator who designed us to, to, be a, uh, to be in relationship with him under his authority, he, he's the one who, who we've rebelled and pushed away. Well, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and, and bore our sins upon himself so that whoever repents of sin turns and, and trusts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will be forgiven of sin and reconciled to God. That's the good news. It starts with the bad news. You're not okay. You're a sinner. And you can't save yourself. But here's the good news. God provided a way through Jesus Christ. In fact, when you turn over to, to chapter uh, 8 of Romans, I'm sorry, chapter 10 of Romans, we see that we're, we're not okay. We, our relationship with God is broken. You need, a re, you need a mediator to reconcile your relationship with God. And that's who Jesus Christ is. In, in Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse nine, look what Paul writes. He says, because now if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's the, the good news. That is the gospel of salvation. He goes on verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And as everyone who believes in Jesus Christ will be saved, will no longer be, be, be condemned. He says in verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who, come, who call on him. For everyone, verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Perhaps if, as you hear this sermon this morning, the response for you is simply this. In your brokenness, you acknowledge you're a sinner in need of a savior, that you can't save yourself. Maybe your response today is simply this. God, I repent of my sin. I turn from my selfishness. I turn from my self-rule. And I realize Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. And I trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. And I want to follow you. Forgive me of my sin through Jesus Christ. Maybe your response today is trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if that's, you've got nothing else out of my sermon today, hear and believe. Hear the gospel and believe in Christ. And if you do that today, please contact the church office. We want to talk with you. We want to pray with you. Uh, and uh, help you out on this journey of following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The other challenge with this is hearing and believing is a call to those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ to proclaim the gospel, to share the good news. Look what Paul continues to say in Romans chapter 10. Verse 13, he says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now verse 14, How then will they call on him? whom they have not believed. And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching or teaching or speaking about Jesus Christ? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who 
preach, who speak, who teach, who proclaim, who share the good news of Jesus Christ. But they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. So here's the call for every believer that is hearing the preaching of this word today. You have been sent. Preach the word. Preach the gospel. Share the good news of Jesus Christ with friends and family and neighbors and coworkers. Tell them about Jesus. Be bold. Tell them the hope we have in Christ. Because if they don't hear, how are they to believe? Right? This combination of hearing and believing. We need to speak so they can hear and then believe in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, though God has chosen those who would be elect before the foundation of the world and Christ redeems and the Holy Spirit is the one who applies that redemption and works in our hearts. God chose the means of you and me to preach the good news. That's our call. Paul is speaking to the Ephesians and he says this, you heard, I preached, you heard, and you believed. Others came and preached the good news and you heard and you believed. So are we preaching the word? Paul rejoices that they heard the word of truth, the good news of salvation through faith in Christ and they believed. And that brings us to the eternal guarantee for all who have heard and believe. Look what he says there in verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, look, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. We, we, we kind of broke this section down, verses 3 through 14, into three parts. And in verses 3 through 6, we see the work of God the Father. In verses 7 through 10, here's the redemption through Jesus Christ, God the Son. And here in verse 11 through 14, we see the sealing of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, the work of the Trinity in our lives. You see, God the Holy Spirit, he's the one who opens our eyes to understand what Christ has done for us. God the Holy Spirit grants us faith to believe in Christ. It is God the Holy Spirit that moves our wills to embrace Christ as our Savior. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we understand what Jesus, God the Son, did for us in dying on the cross. It is the Holy Spirit who, who moves in our lives to apl apply the redemption that God the Father planned and God the Son accomplished. And so then after we trust, after we hear and believe and trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit then indwells every true believer. Capture that. Think about that for a moment. God no longer is out there, up there. God is not distant. God, the Holy Spirit, now walks with us. He's living in the life of every believer. The Holy Spirit gives us understanding of the scriptures. He convicts us of sin. He is the one who empowers us to change and to grow in Christ and, and producing a transformed life. He's the one who prepares us and gives us gifts to serve others. It's, it's God, the Holy Spirit, who's at work in this hard heart to transform us that we love God and love others and serve God and serve others. Paul says that the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is a seal and a guarantee. Think about that, that seal. And I used the illustration at the beginning about the seal that talked about a guarantee that you look for the, the seal on the packaging. Well, in, in ancient Roman times, they'd take and they put a seal on something and a seal means something. And, and, and what does a seal mean? Let me give you three uses or three meanings for a seal. First, a seal is used to signify the authenticity of something. When Alicia and I were adopting Ashton and Aaliyah, all of our documentation, everything that we sent to Honduras had to be notarized, which meant we had to go and sign it in someone's presence. And that notary had to, to stamp it with their seal saying that this signature is authentic. But not only did it have to be notarized, then it had to go to Harrisburg and be apostilled, which means that, that someone who's in charge of the, the uh, notaries says, this notary is true. So it's stamped again. So the state of Pennsylvania is sending off our paperwork to Honduras with a seal on it saying this is authentic. Every piece of paper here that is signed and sealed and stamped multiple times is authentic. 
it's real. It's, it's coming from Andrew and Alicia Crossgrove. It is their signatures. It's their information. It's their certificates of birth and marriage and so forth. You see, the Holy Spirit being present in our lives, he's that seal on us that authenticates our faith in Christ. The Holy Spirit, his presence uh, authenticates that our faith is true. It authenticates God's word in our lives. It authenticates that we are now signed with his signature. It's all true. But it's also a, a, a seal also identifies ownership, all right? So, so not only is it say that it's authentic, our faith is true, but a, a seal also identifies ownership. So we, we have an event we do every year called the Love and Deed Project. And what our Love and Deed Project is, is we, we get jobs that people need done at different homes uh, in our community. And so everyone comes to the church, you bring your tools, and then we, we find out what our jobs are going to be. This one's going to be raking. This one's working on cutting down bushes and so forth. So you grab the, the rakes, the shovels, the tools that you need, right? And you go and you do your job. It, it all gets done and the, everything's brought back to the church. And we go to claim the tools or, or hand them back out. What do we look for? For the name. What's written on the tool? Because that declares the ownership of that tool. Right? Or, or the movie Toy Story. If you remember the Toy Story, I love this because of the name that's there, right? So on Woody's foot, what was there? It says Andy. Because Andy took his, wrote his name on the foot of his, of his, his, uh, a doll on Woody's foot. Woody belonged to Andy. It's almost as if God takes and, and, and he puts the Holy Spirit and he indwells us. He writes his name on us. You're God's. You're Christ's. You belong to me. You see, it's a, that declaration of ownership. The Holy Spirit seals us. We belong to him. He's purchased us through the blood of Christ. We are now his children. We're his church. We're his belonging. We're his people. We belong to him. We're not our own. We're not to live for ourselves anymore. We, we, we are secure in him for all eternity. Nothing can wipe his mark off of us. You see, we're secure in him. The seal is a guarantee. The seal is a mark of authenticity. It's a mark of ownership. And third, it's, it's the guarantee. It's a mark of good faith. If you've ever bought a house, you understand that here's the contract. And Elisa and I bought a house a number of years ago. And I remember sitting there, the contract comes out and you got to initial like every line and sign every page and initial and sign. And you're putting your name all over that contract. And what that is, it's a declaration of good faith. You're signing that contract saying, I will abide by the terms of this contract until the terms are fulfilled. In many ways, God's seal of the Holy Spirit is, is his declaring, in eternity past, I chose you. Through my son, I've redeemed you. You've trusted in Christ and I will fulfill the promise of an eternal promised inheritance. You see, we, we persevere, we press on. We know that, that this life is not all there is. And we, we have the, the confidence that our faith will come to that fulfillment, that uh, fruition of the inheritance that we have obtained in Christ. And why? Because we have the seal. We have God's promise. He says, I declared it. I decreed it. I said it. I'm going to do it. And we see it throughout all scriptures, not just here. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, those whom the Father has given to me, I will raise up in the last day. John chapter 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd. Those, my, my sheep, no one can snatch them out of my hands. Paul writes in Philippians that he who's begun a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Jesus Christ. You, you see that, that perseverance, that preservation that we have in Christ is all through the pages of scripture. He has sealed us in the Holy Spirit. He will bring it to pass so we have confidence in him and therefore we have hope. You see, it's not dependent upon how well we make it through the waves that crash over us. See, our hope isn't in our own ingenuity. Our hope is found in the promised eternal inheritance that we have in Christ and the fact that we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. We have hope. We can press on. We have the assurance and certainty uh, of this. And, and it's a reminder that God who cannot lie, he's all powerful. There's no beginning or end. 
His seal, his signature is on this guarantee. And therefore, we have the assurance and the promises of Scripture. God began the work. He will carry it to completion. We have a certain hope. No matter what the difficulties, when our trials, no matter the ups and downs, the temptations that come in life, we have hope because God is the one who started the work. So as we conclude this, we say, we look at what Paul writes, you've heard, you've believed, and when you believed in Christ, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. What a reason to rejoice. Now notice how Paul concludes this section. He concludes it where he began it back in verse three. Blessed be the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was praise him. And now we come back to verse 14 and how he finishes it. To the praise of his glory. Which leads us to our prayer of response this morning. To the word of God. We're going to focus on that recurring refrain from verses 3 through 14. Is to the praise of his glorious grace. As we consider that we were, we were chosen by God. Redeemed by God the Son sealed by God, the Holy Spirit, our only right response is hope in Christ and praising him. So let us pray together. And then we're gonna praise the Lord as we sing the, the, the great song of the faith. Great is thy faithfulness. We praise him for his faithfulness. Let's pray together. Oh, oh great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise you and we thank you that in eternity past you chose us. You've redeemed us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you've applied that redemption to us as you've convicted us of sin and given us the gift of faith that we may trust in Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have the seal of the Holy Spirit and we have the guarantee of a promised eternal inheritance in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the hope that is ours in Christ, the true hope, the living hope, the certain hope. It's not a hope that, that is is wishy-washy, but is the declaration of hope in a God who declares salvation, declares redemption, and keeps his word. We rejoice in the, the promise that you've given us in Christ. Lord, we, we lift our feeble words to you in praise. And we know that, the, that we sing these words about your greatness, about your faithfulness. And we pray, Lord, that they would be praised to you and worship to you. And, and it would be truly the expression of our brokenness and our hearts as we rejoice in the salvation that we have in Christ that helps us to see beyond the troubles that we face in this life to see the hope that is ours in Christ. We give you the glory now and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen.